PC, accounting for your future. Hi, welcome back. Now let's look at the detailed bits and pieces related to working capital management. Uh, just to recap, so working capital is also known as the net current asset because all we can do is that the working capital is where we're going to take the current assets, subtract the current liabilities. For example, for those payables, for those overdrafts, so that's how we do it. So in this section, we are particularly focusing on how we're going to manage the detailed aspects within the current asset as well as the liability, including, first of all, we're going to manage the receivable balances. Secondly, how we're going to manage the inventory, because that's important, because something we're going to sell. We have to make sure that we haven't got excess amounts of uh, inventories within the warehouse, because that will cost you money. At the same time, we have to maintain is, I mean, uh, I mean, liquidity, uh, so have sufficient inventory in the warehouse. And thirdly, we're going to look at how we're going to manage the bank as well as the cash uh, within a company. We can't hold too much because if you hold too much cash, uh, you've got, uh, I mean, a significant amount of opportunity cost for your company. Current liabilities, then, we're going to see how we're going to manage the payables as well. Okay, so those are the bits and pieces that we will be looking at in the following sections. Now let's look at how we're going to manage the receivable balance or receivable management. So before we dip into any further, let's look back from the financial accounting's perspective. So what do I mean by receivable is this. Here's the company, and this company sells the goods on credit to a customer. And this means that the customer is the buyer and the company is the seller. As the receivable is what we're going to record from the seller's perspective, how we're going to, I mean, uh, record this transaction is what we're going to say well because we sell the goods on credit which means the customer hasn't paid for us yet and as a result of it from the seller's perspective we increase the sales revenue by crediting the sales revenue at the same time we're going to debit the receivable rather than the bank because we haven't received the money yet that's the reason why we're going to do this here that's from the seller's perspective but the critical question is, before we sell the goods on credit to that customer, we have to make sure is the customer, for example, called John, is credit worthy before we grant the credit to him. Otherwise, if we say to John, you don't have to pay for me now, we're going to pay for me 30 days later, what if at the end of the 30 days, John disappeared? And of course, we sold the goods to them, uh, we sold the goods to John, but uh, in effect, the goods are I mean, stolen by John as a result. So we'll have to do from the receivable management's perspective. First of all, we're going to make sure that this customer is credit worthy. But how are we going to do that then? And also, we're going to make sure that, uh, I mean, uh, granting, the process, uh, granting the credit to the customer uh, process will be good as well. So that's the first move we look at, how we're going to manage the receivable. And secondly, if you see the double entry here, we debit the receivable, but we could have debited the cash in the first place. And once we obtain that cash, we can put that into a bank and receive the interest income from the bank. But now we've lost that opportunity. It's simply because we should have got that cash, but we haven't. We recognize it's a receivable. It's the money that is owed by the customer. So that's what we need to do from the financial management's perspective. We have to calculate something called the opportunity cost okay for that receivable it's simply we're going to take the receivable balance multiply by the interest rate and that's all we need to do but the question is how are we going to arrive at that receivable then normally this will be written into the invoice directly but in the exam your examiner may test this particular topic 
with the changes in the receivable, um, I mean, management policy. By saying that, if you offer early settlement discounts to those uh, customers, they would like to accept the offer and reduce the receivable days as well. That's the reason why we also need to focus on how we're going to arrive that receivable balance is because the receivable days equals so receivable balance on TSFP divided by sales revenue and times 365. So to do this, because we need to work out the receivable balance, we know the receivable days because it's given the question. We know the sales revenue currently, we know 365, so we're going to rearrange the formula so it can give us the receivable balance. So the cost of that receivable is we're going to take the receivable balance here, we're going to times the interest rate. That's all we need to do. Those are the two things that we're going to look at. So recap, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to see how we're going to manage the receivable from a practical perspective. Secondly, is we're going to see how we're going to uh, calculate the costs of funding that receivable. So let's look at the first one, is how we're going to manage that receivable from the practical perspective. So the first thing that we're going to do then is we're going to look at the credit status of the customer. So we're going to see whether or not John, for example, in this case, is credit worthy. But what sort of aspects that we need to look at then? We're going to use the mnemonics for this, it's called SCRIPT, as you can see in your notes. The first S stands for, we're going to secure a bank reference. So we're going to go to the bank with the client's permission, we're going to go to the bank to see whether or not the client has defaulted onto payment in the first place. So that's bank reference. Secondly, for those large companies especially, we're going to look at the credit agents. For example, the Standard & Poor, Moody. So we can look at those reports, especially for those populistic companies, to see their risks, whether or not they are quite risky, whether or not they have defaulted onto a payment in the first place. Of course, we can review the reputation of this customer. Normally, we're going to ask the opinion from our staff. Have you seen a newspaper regarding this customer in the magazines? For example, it's defaulting onto payments, or maybe involved in some of the illegal activities, etc. Of course, those will be, I mean, uh, written into magazines or newspaper. And alternatively, of course, uh, you can ask uh, the staff, yeah, within your company or in their companies, uh, to see whether or not the reputation of this customer is good or bad. I mean, it's not that difficult, really. And of course, we can look at the information which is I of that company. Of course, by checking out his websites directly, we can obtain those information necessary. Of course, we can have a look at the press reports as well, which means we are looking at the newspaper to see any of these uh, adverse or I mean events that will damage its reputation has occurred. Of course, for example, default on to a payment, so we can see what's going on. And finally, we can look at his trade reference, particularly with clients' permission we are going to see whether or not the dealers with the customer before is happy about the customer. So, I mean, if the dealers that is trading with the customers before are not happy with the customer because the customer has defaulted onto the payment in the first place, surely we are not going to do business with this customer. But it's entirely up to the management to within a company. So that's the reason why. How to check the credit status of a customer? We're going to use the mnemonic called script. And then once you've decided to give the credit to that customer, which means, well, we're going to allow you to pay for me maybe five days or maybe 15 days later. The next thing we're going to do then is we're going to set out the terms within a contract. So we're going to say to John, well, surely I will allow you to pay for me late. But here's the few things that you need to care about. First of all, it's the credit period. For example, we're going to allow you to pay for me within 15 days. Fine. So credit period needs to be set out first of all. Secondly, we need to set out the credit limit. So for example, within this invoice, it's to be $1 million. And you have to pay for me $400,000 now 
with another six hundred thousand dollars within 15 days time so that's the maximum credit limits that I've set this is particularly useful uh, into managing the internal control process uh, in internal control systems within a company because many of these marketing staff or sales staff would like to give lots of credit to a customer because by doing so the sales staff will get a bonus out of it without considering the ability that this customer uh, can pay back to the, pay back to the company in the first place in the future as a result of it setting up this credit limit not only for the individual customers but also as a policy within the sales department will surely help it's simply because it will decrease the risks that the customer will not pay for us in the future and also we're going to set out the interest so for example if you I mean I'm not going to set your payments within that 15 days for example at 16th day I'm going to start to charge you the interest expense for example 0.05 percent of the outstanding balance as well okay so that's the interest we're going to set and also we can set the discount on early payment so your discount for example this is also known as the cash discount or early settlement discount for example if you set to that six hundred thousand uh, dollars I mean within three days I'm gonna give you three percent uh, of this um, early settlement discount okay so that's the way that we're going to I mean uh, trying to uh, motivate the customer to pay for us uh, relatively early so from the accounting's perspective if you grant this particular early settlement discount so how we're going to do that then is we're going to debit the expense which, mean, which means it's the discount allowed expense we're going to credit the receivable now at the same time for those customers who accepted that early settlement discount we're going to debit the payable and credit the income which is the discount received income as a result so that's from a company's perspective and that's from the uh, customer's perspective so early settlement discount but the question you may have well Steve how we should decide whether or not we should accept that early settlement discount which, which means it's three percent or from a company's uh, I mean that's from the customer's perspective we're going to detail that into a payable section but now standing from a company's perspective so if you want to motivate your customer to pay for you early how are we going to set up that early settlement discount by how much we're going to set it at three percent or four percent of course, we will look at the criteria or method of how to determine that 3% in a second. Okay, so once you set out the terms and you decide the uh, customer is credit worthy, and then you start giving credit to that customer, saying to them, well, you don't have to pay for me right now, you're going to pay for me within 15 days, but you subsequently find out that this customer has defaulted onto the payment, which means at the end of the 15th day, we still haven't received the payment from that customer. So what we need to do then is that we need to have the day-to-day -day policy. So for example, we're going to send them the amount of money they owe to us in the email or in the letter. So we're going to say to John, you owe to me $600,000, you have to pay for it today. But if John has not replied to this email, we're going to send a reminder again to John you have to pay for me for six hundred thousand dollars otherwise I'm gonna uh, sue you so if John uh, still refused to reply to me we're gonna threaten uh, John to take legal action so I'm gonna I mean telephone you I'm gonna sue you in a court so if John still refused to reply to me we're gonna take action we're gonna sue John directly in the court but the question is, I mean, for some of the customers, maybe the amount in the invoice is relatively small. 
So we may balance whether or not we should sue this particular customer in court or we're going to allow it uh, to be as a bad day expense, particularly if the customer is the, in the overseas countries, for example. So for example, if John is located in the overseas country and John has owed us maybe $3,000. So maybe from my perspective, maybe it's not quite appropriate for our company to sue John if John hasn't paid for us. We sue John in there, uh, I mean, uh, in the overseas country, for example, because if you pay, I mean, if you think about the uh, uh, travel expenses for your staff to go to that overseas country to sue John, I mean, that amount of money will be much greater than the $3,000 as a result. And as a result of it, from a company's perspective, although we're threatened to take legal action in the real life, but uh, not in every circumstances we're going to do that in the real life. So we need to balance the cost as well as the benefit uh, of this particular decision, H1. And surely, one of the powerful day-to-day -day running of the policy is we're going to use the third-party company to collect the uh, debt yeah? uh, I mean on our behalf. So that's called the debt factoring. Debt factoring is we're going to outsource the receivable balance collection uh, to that third party or the third party company who collects the uh, receivable on behalf of me. So it's entirely up to them to telephone those customers. It's, it's time for you to pay for, for example, APC. So please pay for APC. If not, I'm going to do something uh, to you. Right, so that's the fact that factoring company. But one of the key points they need to notice here is this. If you're going to use the debt factoring company in the real life, maybe it will damage your own reputation as a result. Because you may be seen that, well, the confidential information is passed through to the third party company. So from other customers' perspective, they think that this is not appropriate. As a result of it, they are unwilling to trade with you at some point in the future. So although using a debt factoring company is relatively quick to collect that money from a customer and also using a debt factoring company can save us quite a lot of cost. For example, we don't have to employ extra staff within our company to collect the receivable on behalf of us. So that is good. But at the same time, it's bad because it would damage your reputation as a result. Okay. So... That's the thing that we just look at. So this is the first part of the section is how we're going to manage the receivable from a practical perspective. So we've looked at, first of all, we're going to decide whether or not this customer is credit worthy by using mnemonic or script. And then once we've decided this customer is credit worthy, we then set out the terms yeah, related to this uh, credit sale. And then if the customer hasn't paid for us, we're going to see the day-to-day -day policy. Okay, so that's the uh, practical aspect of how we're going to manage the receivable. So the second aspect within this uh, recording is we're going to see how we're going to calculate the costs related to the receivable balance. So how we're going to fund that receivable as well. Right, so in order to do this, the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is this. How we're going to calculate that opportunity cost is where we simply take the receivable balance, maybe onto SFP, or maybe we're going to calculate it using the receivable days formula, and we're going to times the interest rate. So it can give us the, uh, I mean, the costs of financing the receivable. Because in most of the circumstances, receivable stands for the money that you haven't collected from the customer. And as a result of it, you should have got this money to invest in somewhere else to generate the return, but now you've lost that particular opportunity. So that's the reason why we're going to consider the opportunity costs related to that receivable. So as a result of it, so let's see a particular question to see how we're going to uh, deal with this. Okay, before we dip into any further. The question is called BUP POC. So we are told in the question, whether the change in receivable policy is financially acceptable. So let's see how we're going to deal with this then. In terms of the question, but POC has the credit sales of $12 million. So credit sales 
This means that we debit the receivable and credit the sales revenue. This stands for the money that we haven't collected from a customer, or this stands for the cash we haven't collected from a customer yet. So three months were allowed for the payments, and as a result of it, the current receivable days is to be three months. Each month we've got 30 days so that we've got 90 days in total. So by doing so, because we are also given the credit sales uh, within this company, but we haven't, we are not told about the current receivable balance. So how are we going to arrive at the receivable balance then? I told you. The receivable balance, either we're going to obtain that from the statement of the financial position, but in this case, we are not giving the question. And second way that we can do is we're going to work out the receivable balance from the receivable days formally. So in this case, because we are told the receivable days that we've got is to be 90, that equals to receivable balance divided by sales revenue. Sales revenue we are told is to be $12 million times 365. So we know this, we know this, and we know this. How are we gonna arrive at that then? Of course, we're gonna rearrange the formula, simple as this. So all we can do is we're gonna take receivable days 90 divided by 365, and we're gonna times 12 million, so you can give us the uh, 3 million dollars as the receivable as the receivable balance, okay, of 300, uh, sorry, 3 million dollars here. So that's the uh, current of our policy. Now let's look at this. The company decides to offer 2% of early settlement discount for the payments made within 10 days of the invoice being sent and reduce the maximum of three months credit period down to two months. So as a result of it, by offering that discount, 50% of the customers will take that discount and overall we can, uh, I mean, we also reduce the uh, uh, receivable days from 90 days down to 60 days because it's two months, yeah? And at the same time, 50% of the customer will accept that discount and pay within 10 days. Another 50% of the customer will pay within uh, 60 days. And we are told Bob, uh, sorry, Bob PLC requires a 20% return on investment as well. So that will calculate the uh, I mean, cost the receivable by taking the interest rate of 20% times that receivable balance. So what we what we need to do then is we're going to calculate the revised receivable balance. So all we can do is that we've got 50% of the customer will accept the discount with another 50% of the customer will not accept that discount. So that will give us the revised receivable balance here. So the first 50% of the customer will accept the discount so that they will pay within 10 days. And now we'd like to work out the receivable balance. How are we going to do that? Either we're going to take that from the statement financial position, in this case we are not given, or we're going to work out from the receivable days formula, so we can work that out. And here, so we're going to directly rearrange the formula. So because now we are going to pay within 10 days, divide by 365, and then we're going to times the sales revenue or credit sales of 12 million. So that gives us the first half of the revised receivable balance here, accounted for 50%. And another 
50% of a customer will pay within two months, which is 60 days, times 12 million. So the revised receivable balance as a result of it will be $1,164,384. So because of this, so if you look up here, so currently we got three million worth of receivable, but as a result of the new policy, we got the receivable reduced down to one million one sixty four three hundred eighty four. So it's the reduction in the receivable, and that means receivable balances needs to be funded because, for example, we should have got three hundred about three million dollars from you, but we haven't got that money from you. As a result of it, we need that money to operate our business, but now we lost that money. So as a result of it, what we can do is we're going to think about the way that we're going to finance this $3 million by borrowing some money from the bank. For example, that costs us money. So that's the opportunity cost. And because of the reduction in the receivable balance, that means the company can save money as a result of it. So... The outcome is this. First of all, the reduction in receivable is we're going to take 3 million minus 1 million 164 384 dollars. And because we can use that uh, amount of money that we've saved. Uh, to invest into the, uh, I mean, for example, the short-term securities and earn the required return with a total question of 20%. Okay? So, that's how we arrive at this. So, that would give us 367,123. Or you can call it as the extra income to the company. Secondly, we also need to consider that 2% of discounts for the payments. Because we got a credit sales of 12 million, and we're going to offer 2% of discount. So discount allowed, which means the expense to the company. So we take 12 million times 2% of discount. But you notice here, for those discounts that will be accepted by those customers, we only account for 50% of them. So that will give us the discount allowed expenses to be 120000 dollars So that the net benefit. That we will get as a result of it will be 247,123 uh, dollars. So this means as a result of the changing in the receivable month, uh, receivable balance management policy, we can have the net benefit of 247,123. So that from the financials perspective, we are going to accept that policy. Okay. So that's how we deal with it. I hope this is not a jargon. Right. Now, let's look at the costs of the early settlement discount. Because I said to you before, in practical management of the receivable balance, I just said to you, whether or not we should give the customer of 2% of the early settlement discount, whether or not this is, uh, this, is, this is worthwhile. I mean, the way that we're going to deal with this is we're going to use that 2% of early settlement discount and we're going to convert that into the cost to a company. So we're going to compare that cost with the cost of financing these activities by borrowing some money from the bank. So for example, if the interest rate is just to be uh, 5%, but if you offer 2% of discount, by taking into account other factors, it will give you the net cost of 10%. Surely we are not going to allow 2% of discount to a customer because we can surely 
fund the business by borrowing some money from the bank in the first place by using interest rates of 5%, which is less than the, uh, uh, the cost rates that we just got kept before. So that's the reason why we are going to introduce this formula. So you have to learn this, okay, on your own. So as you can see, we take 100 divided by 100 minus the D. So D is for discounts that we're going to offer. For example, it's to be 2% of discount. And as a result of it, we will take a power of 365 divided by T. So T stands for the reduction in the payment period. So notice, we're going to express that in days. It's simply because we've used 365 days before, so we're going to match against that calculation. And then once you've done that, plot that into your calculator, you then minus 1, so express that as a percentage rate 1. That's how you do it. So now let's look at the question uh, related to this to see how we're going to apply this into the actual question itself. So this question is called PJPLC. So let's look at the requirement first of all. Calculate the net cost to the company by considering other factors of offering the discount. In this case, it's 2% of discount, whether or not this is acceptable. So all we need to do is we're going to compare that cost percentage with the interest rate, for example, or the cost of financing a business. So we are told the interest rate in this case is to be 6%. So in the question that may give you some of the um, equity finance as well, maybe you're going to compare that to a weight of cost of capital. So it's entirely up to you. In this case, we are given the interest rate only. So we only use 6% here. So how are we going to calculate that cost percentage then? So all we need to do is we're going to use that pro forma, 100 divided by 100 minus the discount. And then we'll take the power, 365 divided by the number of days, that is reduction after implementing uh, this new policy by giving a new discount or early settlement discount. We're going to minus one. And in this case, we are told to the question, the discount is to be 2%. So that we're going to substitute that D with 2, because all in percentage, because 100%, divide by 100% minus 2%. And after allowing the dis early settlement discount to a customer, it says to me, we've got 30 days of receivable days, I will be reduced down to 10 days. This means 30 minus 10, so there will be 20 days of reduction in the receivable days after this uh, new policy has come into being. And as a result of it, the T will be 20 over here. So if you plot that into a calculator, that should give you the cost of 44.6%. It's much greater than the uh, interest rates they're going to borrow from, from the bank, for example, of 6%. So from this perspective, then, we are not going to allow 2% yeah, of early settlement discount to a customer. Because by doing so, of course, you should have, I mean, gone to a bank to borrow some money at 6%. But now, if you offer that 2% of discount, that net cost to you is... 44.6% and this is not financially acceptable. So from this perspective then, when you're offering the discount, you have to calculate this by saying that, well, you're going to compare your weight of cost of capital or the interest rate, in this case it is 6%. So any rate that is less than 6% is financially acceptable. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind it. So let's look back at uh, what we've talked about today. First of all, we looked at from a practical perspective. We're going to see how we're going to manage the receivable. And secondly, we calculate the cost of funding our receivable balances because receivable is the current asset. Current asset needs to be funded. But one final question before we leave this topic is this. You see, we've looked at how we're going to manage the receivable balance from a practical perspective. In this case, it's for the customer, John. I just talked to you about, for John, receivable management, uh, in the day-to-day -day policy, 
we also introduced a concept called debt factoring, which means we're going to allow the third party company to collect the debt on behalf of our company. So that by doing so, from a company's point of view, we can save the admin costs. It's simply because we don't have to employ extra staff to collect those receivable on behalf of the company. So that it saves quite a lot of costs. So that from this perspective then, less detail, the final topic for the receivable arrangement is for the debt factoring company. So what that factoring company normally does is to offer these two services. Firstly, the invoice discounting. And secondly, the debt factoring services. So what do I mean by invoice discounting? So, well, if you're trading with the large companies in the marketplace, for example, you've got high quality of invoice, but because that company will pay for you maybe 15 days later, that to you, that would mean that this will be a receivable balance. You need that money right now, but how are you going to do that? So maybe you're going to approach the debt factoring company, you're going to present that invoice, for example, it's worth at $30 million to the debt factoring company. A debt factoring company seeing your invoice is high quality so that the debt factoring company will discount that invoice, for example, to $29 million. So providing you with the $29 uh, million right now of cash to you. So receive that $29 million of cash immediately. So when you receive that invoice or re when you receive that cash of $30 million from, for example, the Microsoft Incorporation, maybe within, uh, in 15 days time, so what you're going to do is going to repay that $29 million uh, worth of money to the debt factoring company and also you're going to pay for the interest expense or the, uh, I mean expense, that's the debt factoring company that's providing you the service. So debt factoring company, uh, maybe in 15 days. So normally, for example, in this case, you're going to pay for additional $1 million because it's the difference between the face value and the value that the debt factoring company has given to you in advance. Okay, so it's, that's how the invoice discounting works. So in simple words, invoice discounting is acting as a security when borrowing some money from the debt factoring company in the first place. Okay, simple. Now let's look at the debt factoring services. So debt factoring services can be divided into two. First of all, the debt factoring company can collect the money on your behalf in making sure that uh, your receivable balance can be uh, collected from the customer. Alternatively, the debt factoring company will give you the finance in advance. The financing of business. And of course, when debt factoring provides the finance to your business, uh, before you collect the money from a customer. And also the debt factoring company will collect those money uh, from the customer on behalf of you. Uh, of course, they will charge you a high interest rate based on that. So in simple words, the debt factoring company is the third party company who goes to a customer's office to collect that money on behalf of you. So that's the first one. Alternatively, the debt factoring company not only will go to uh, the customer's office to uh, collect the money on behalf of you, but also will provide you with the finance that you should have received from a customer in the first place before. So those are the services that is provided by the debt factoring company. So having said that, if it is the debt factoring company, if the debt factoring services, either it would be the non-recourse basis or it would be on a recourse basis. So what do I mean by non-recourse basis is simply this. The debt factoring company may agree to you in the contract 
I will collect that money from the customer on behalf of you. What two? That debt factoring company cannot collect that money from a customer. And surely, under non-recourse basis, the debt, debt factoring company has to suffer. So you agreed to me to pay for $30 million, but uh, if you haven't collected that money from the customer of $30 million, uh, of course, you will suffer. You will bear that losses because you provided your money to me of $30 in advance, for example, providing me with the finance. Alternatively, it is on a recourse basis. This means if the debt factoring company cannot collect the money from a customer, they will ask, or the debt factoring company will ask our company to return that money in the first place. I provide it to you in advance. Okay, so that's how we do it. So non-recourse basis, the debt factoring company will suffer, but recourse basis, the debt factoring company will not suffer if the debt factoring company cannot collect the money from a customer in the first place. Simple. So all we need to know is first of all these types of non-recourse and recourse basis, and secondly is the uh, I mean normally for non-recourse basis the debt factoring company will charge us a higher expense. So now let's put this theory into practice. Then now let's look at the question called factor complaint in your notes, so that we can see how we're going to apply this concept in the actual case together. So, required, we're going to calculate the value of the factors offer. First of all, with recourse basis, which means if the debt factoring company cannot collect the money from a customer, the debt factoring company will surely be not responsible for it. Or a non recourse basis, which means the debt factoring company, if they cannot uh, collect the money from a customer, they have to suffer. Right, let's see them. A factor has offered to manage the receivable of the bold company in a servicing and factor financing agreement. That means they sign a contract with us to collect the money on our behalf. Secondly, the factor company expects to reduce the receivable days from the current level so 35 days. So what we need to do is we're going to think about uh, what is the current level of the receivable day. So we're going to calculate that on our own. And we're going to re reduce that bad debt from 0.9% of the sales revenue to 0.6% of the sales revenue as well. So I mean because they can collect the money on behalf of us so that the customer will surely have to pay for us. So the bad debt expense will reduce and save our admin cost of $40,000 per year because we don't have to employ extra staff to do that. So it will save our admin cost. Fine. The third of our paragraph, it says, the fact will also make an advance to our company of 80% of the revised receivable balance. And that means they're going to collect the money on behalf of us and also they're going to offer us the finance. If the office is a finance, the interest rate will be 2% higher than the 7% that currently our company pays on to overdraft. And that means for those finance, they will charge us 9% of the interest rate. So we're going to consider into that as well. So here's two um, I mean choices. First of all, for those finance that is offered by the uh, factor company, it can be on a non -rec uh, with recourse basis, the rate is to be 0.75%. And that means if the clients, uh, if, if the factor complaint cannot collect the money from the customer, surely we would have to pay back those 80% of the advance, uh, of the financing advance provided by that factor complaint in the first place. So the rate is slightly lower than the non-recourse basis, which is 1.25%. Because if the, uh, I mean, debt factoring cannot collect the money from a customer, they have to suffer. So we're going to assume that 365 days in a year, and all of the sales revenues are on credit, which means the credit sales or receivable balances we're going to calculate. And we are told 
The current receivable balance is 53.5, sales revenue is 53.13. So we know that the receivable balance is 53.5, so we're going to calculate the current receivable days as a result. So let's data that here. First of all, with recall spaces. So if it is with recall spaces, there will be certain bad debt exists within a company. But under the non recall spaces, because all of these uh, risks, I mean, the debt factor in company has to suffer. Surely, with uh, non recall spaces, there will be no bad debt expenses anymore. So we'll discuss about that in a second. So with recall spaces, what we're going to do is we're going to compare the fees that we've paid with the benefit that we've got so that we can decide whether or not we will accept that with recall spaces or non recall spaces later on. We will see that whether or not it will be a net expense or net benefit as a result. And we are told that with recall spaces, we're going to pay for 0.75% of the expense for the total sales revenue or credit sales of $21.3 million because all of them are the credit sales. So the fees in total is to be. 159 dollars Okay, so that's the first one. So how are we going to calculate the benefit then? So we're going to start small working here. So by using the uh, I mean debt factoring services, first of all, we can save our admin of forty thousand dollars per year because we don't have to employ extra staff to do that work for me in a second to the paragraph over here. And secondly, we can reduce our bad debt as well. Because it said we're going to reduce the bad debt from 0.9 of the sales revenue or turnover to 0.6% of the turnover. That means we've saved 3% of those uh, bad debt expenses on the sales revenue of $21.3 million. So that would give us a total of 63900 as the extra benefit. So not only for that then, because we are going to say we will pay for the additional interest expense on those 80% of the revised receivable balances. So all we need to do then is this. So we're going to minus the additional interest paid. In this case, it's to be 2% of the extra interest expense we will pay for on those revised receivable balance, and that will account for 80% of those. So what we need to do is we're going to calculate that revised receivable balance here. So how we're going to do this? Simply, we're going to take, so because in this case, by using a new policy, we can reduce that receivable basis to be 35. So all we need to do is take 35, divide by 365 days times 21.3 million dollars worth of sales revenue. That would give us the revised receivable balance over here. And the total amount that we just calculated is to be 2 million and 42,466. So the additional interest paid as a result of it would be 32 680 and hence the net benefit that we've got so we're going to plus them all together at mean savings reduction back debts as well as the uh, additional interest paid so that would give us 173 247 so we're going to slot that back here so benefits is to be 173 and 247 so the net benefit that we've got is to be 13 
497 as the result. So because here is the net benefits that we can get, so that surely, yeah, that will be the benefit with the recall spaces. So we're going to compare the benefit that we've got under recall basis with the benefit that we've got under the non recall spaces. So let's see. Under the non recall spaces. So, first of all, we're going to compare the fee with the benefits uh, that we've got. And we are toasting across in those fees, so in your full field paragraph, it's to be 1.25%. So all you need to do, 1.25% times the total sales revenue of $21.3 million. That should give us $266,250. So that's the fees we're going to pay for on today's debt faction company with the non-recall spaces. But the benefits that we can have of course, we just calculated from before, if you remember that. It's to be 173,247. So I'm going to type that in here. Because by using which agreements that you want, uh, surely you can save the admin, you can reduce the back debts. But here, under the non recall spaces, for the debt faction company, they would suffer all of those risks uh, of the back debt expenses. So from the company's perspective, with no risks related to the back debt, related to that receivable anymore. And hence what we need to do from the company's point of view. But also think about, we're gonna eliminate all of those back debt expenses as well. So for the back debt elimination then, because in the previous of our calculation for the benefit, we reduce 3% of the back debt. So this means, let's see here, we have got 0.9% of the back debt, and now reduce down to 0.6% of the back debt. So this means that we reduced 0.3% of the back debt which is calculated under the referee course basis. But we still got 0.6% of the back debt within a company. Now we're going to eliminate all of them. That's the reason why we are going to minus, I mean, uh, we are going to say that this will be a benefit to the company. Yeah? So we eliminate this 0.6% of the remaining $21.3 million of the sales revenue. And as a result of it, that would give us 127800 so that the net benefit that we can have is to be 34,779 with the non recourse basis. So if we compare that with the with recourse basis, that will only offer us 13,497. But with the non recourse basis, it will offer us a higher benefit. So from the financial perspective, we are going to sign a contract with the debt faction company under the non recall spaces as a result. Right then, so um, I think um, they've done a very good job. Uh, I mean, this will be a very, very tough question. Uh, and you understand it? Fantastic. So let's do the recap of the receivable management again. So receivable balance management, all we need to think about is this too. Firstly, how we're going to manage the receivable balance from the practical perspective. First of all, we're going to decide whether or not this customer is credit worthy, and then we're going to set the terms, and then we're going to consider the day-to-day -day policy. So we're going to particularly considering the debt factor and company. So this is the first one that we just look at. Secondly, because for those receivable balances, we should have got those money in place, but we haven't. So we need to consider those opportunity costs in funding those receivable. The way that we're going to do it is simply we're going to take the receivable balance times the interest rate. That will give us the opportunity costs for funding those receivable, and that will be a cost to the companies as well. How are we going to calculate that receivable balance then? First of all, we can directly take that from the SFP. Secondly, we can, based upon the receivable days formula, 
to arrive at that receivable balance so we can calculate that on our own. And finally, we look at the concept called early settlement discount. It's both the debt factoring company with recall spaces or non recall spaces. So those will be the things that is in your syllabus. Right, that's the end of this recording for the receivable section and hope to see you in the next one. APC, accounting for your future.